Last Sunday night, I sent an email I could do every Sunday night to my prayer partners. I have 14 of them. Asked them to pray for me, and each week, about half of them replies back. And one of them did, Sunday night. He said that his grandson, uh, who's two months old, was diagnosed last week as being totally deaf. And so I called him back, and uh, I said, Hey, James, I saw this, and sure, I'm praying for you and your family, and and uh, just wanted you to know that I am. And he said, well, uh, uh, it was actually on Tuesday when I called him back. He said, S Sunday night we got more bad news. He said, we found out today that he also has an enlarged heart. In fact, his heart is twice the size that is normal for a little baby his, his age. And so they've got a real challenge ahead of them, don't they? And, uh, you know, we're, we're surrounded by folks who have similar situations as those, do we not? And that begs the question, the title for today's message, Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, these are good people. That little baby's dad, my friend's son, is a seminary student preparing for the ministry. And his mother is a nurse. And so uh, these are people that, you know, the kinds of people we all look up to. Why do bad things? happen to good people. There's another way that that question is sometimes put. If you say that God is powerful and good, then why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Those are relevant questions, are they not? You and I work alongside and we're neighbors with people who are held up on those two very questions. Tuesday night, I was in Garrison, Texas at a Baptist church, and uh, it's a church where, oh, that's Cooper, the little baby I just mentioned, but the, the church where Ryan King used to be pastor. But Ryan was killed in an ATV accident in August in Colorado, along with his brother-in-law and then two other relatives. One of those relatives is in such difficult shape that so far the medical bills are ranging between two and three million dollars. What a good thing why do bad things happen to good people? Really good man, Ryan King, pastor of a Baptist church. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was with these two friends, seminary buddies of mine. It's William Taylor on the left. He's the missions pastor at First Baptist Church in Houston. And uh, our friend Enos Weswa was in town. And Enos was a seminary roommate of ours back in the day. And a wonderful man, he went back to Kenya after he graduated from Southwestern Seminary and taught in the seminary there. Really godly man. And Enos was back in the United States visiting friends, and we got to visit. But then, just a little while after that, back in Kenya, he was killed by an Islamic extremist. And so we are, we live in a world that was created by a great God, a good world, and yet bad things happen. And so I uh, just wanted to talk about that out loud this morning. I, I worked on it all week long just for myself, trying to process the, that dilemma that is ours, is it not? And uh, a few weeks ago, a college student said, I used to believe in God, but not since my grandmother died. And then another friend of mine uh, said that, I no longer believe in God because of what my ex-wife did to me. So these are relevant questions. C.S. Lewis himself was a young child. He was 10 years old when his mother died of cancer. His grandfather was an Anglican priest. And he had the childhood faith that many of us grew up with. And he abandoned his faith because he couldn't reconcile that dilemma. Why a good God who's powerful would let my mother die when I was 10 years old. And then, you know, on the, the grander scale, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, the hurricanes, the floods, the droughts, you know, we do live in a world that is suffering the consequences of, uh, of fall. And so what I'd like for us to do this morning is this, let's do, let's look at that question, why do bad things happen to good people? And what we're going to do, we're going to start in Genesis. And we're going to end up in Revelation. Because the Bible is not mute on this subject. And so we will just work our way through. And there will be five different stages along the way that help me reconcile 
that dilemma why bad things happen to good people. So join with me if you would, and we'll look at what the Bible has to say about this very relevant subject. Starting, starting off in Genesis, you know how the Bible starts in the beginning, God. And in the very first chapter, it uses a word that God used to uh, appraise what he had done. And that word was this, good. In fact, seven times in the first chapter of the Bible, God said, it is good. It is good. When he created light, he said, it is good. When he created the earth, he said, it is good. When he created the plants, he said, it is good. The stars and the moon and the sun, it is good. And then when he created the oceans and then all of the animals, at each of those junctures, God appraised it and said, it is good. Actually, 15 times God said it is good in the first three chapters of the Bible. And uh, one of those was really a summary. And, and there are actually two creation accounts in Genesis. You know, one and then it kind of repeats. And at the conclusion of that first Genesis account, this was God's appraisal. When he examined his creation at the conclusion of the sixth day and declared, Behold, it is very good. And what that term means in the Hebrew language means this. Perfectly excellent. It was all good, all perfectly good. Another way of translating that, that phrase would be, all went according to plan. Perfectly excellent. Well, what happened then? Well, if you read just a little bit further <laughs> in the book of Genesis... And you can, we can begin to see what happened. It's in part answer to this question, is it not? You know, how many times have we, how many times have I, I've made a poor choice or done something and, and I'm suffering the consequences and then I get mad at God. <laughs> but, but really, I'm suffering the consequences of my own actions. And in fact, that's what happened to the very first man, the very first woman. And you know the story as well as I you know, they did exactly what God said not to do. And the consequences were immediate, and they were catastrophic. And this is what God said. Because, of, because you have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, cursed is the ground, even the ground, because of you. And pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. That's, that's what's referred to as the fall. That is the fall. The fall of man. And the consequences go all throughout creation because of the fall. But we don't only have, you know, Adam to blame for that, do we? Each of us has been participants in the very same thing that happened. We've all followed suit. In fact, it says that uh, in, in Isaiah, and I picked some passages out of Isaiah because he was a true prophet. And who's a prophet? It's a man to whom God gives insight into the future. It's a man to whom God gives insight into even the present. And God speaks through him to the rest of us to make sense of the things that are going on. Or even to foretell the things that will happen in the future. And that's who Isaiah was. And he's, he's counted among what are called the major prophets in the Old Testament. And then we have some that are minor prophets. Mostly they get that designation because of the volume of the work that they produce, that God inspired them to write. And Isaiah gives us insight into this same, very same question. Because you know what? It's not just a 21st century question. It was a question in the hearts and minds of people even that far back. And so God was speaking to this very question even as far back in the Old Testament. But what he said was, he, he didn't let us off the hook, did he? He didn't say, blame it on Adam. Let's all be mad at him. <laughs> he said, look, hey everybody, if we had been the Adam, we would have done the same thing too. And in fact, we followed suit. We all, have we not? We all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us, each one of us, has turned to our own way. And so we're not only suffering the consequences of the fall, we are also even participants in the fall. 
Then that same sentiment was echoed in, in Romans. You know, Paul writing to the church at Rome, book that we referred to last Sunday, says, for all have sinned, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're beginning to uncover some of the reasons, some of the answer to that question. Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? It's because of rebellion. It's because of rebellion that you and I are participants in today. I was reading a book by Rod, Rob Bell uh, some years ago. It's called Blue Like Jazz. I don't know if you heard of that book. And he was with a friend in Rwanda. And I don't know if you know about, there was a genocide in Rwanda. Uh, literally millions of people had been killed. And uh, it was because of their faith. And they have a museum there now. And and uh, part of the museum is in a church where some of these atrocities even took place. And a girl was with Rob Bell in that church. And she was just so utterly disgusted by what that church and those events commemorated. And she had that question. How could a loving and powerful God have ever let this happen? Why did God do this? To which Rob Bell, he said, I felt inspired. When I answered, I said... This, is not hap this isn't the kind of thing that happens that God causes. This is the kind of thing that happens when man rebels against him. This is not what happens because of God. It's, ha it's what happens when we leave God out. And in the same way, you know, cold is measured by its opposite. What is that? The absence of heat. Darkness is measured by the absence of what? Light. And so evil is even measured by the absence of good and the goodness of God. And so really, it's in the shadows. It's when we leave God out. When we have left God out, then that we see the consequences of life and earth and even a universe that's lived without his presence and his help and his participation. So you see, we're, we're all participants, aren't we? Started out listing, you know, three really good people close to me in my life. My friend James, the grandparent of the, the little baby. Uh, Ryan King, the former pastor of a church. And then Enos, one of the most godly men I've ever known. And so we look at folks like that and we, we categorize them as good people. But not in comparison with God. Each of us has gone astray. And, and even Enos, he had his times of rebellion against God. And even James and his son. And uh, so if, if we think, well, why do bad things happen to good people? I guess one of the questions to answer is, who's good? Really? Are any of us? And according to Isaiah and according to Paul then we're all participants in this thing that we call the fall. Well, let's keep on going. Um, until Jesus. You know, it's not like God had his arms folded and was unaware of what was going on and all unaware of the pain and suffering, is it? In fact, he left that place where it was still completely perfect, untouched by the fall. He left heaven. And he came down to join us in the world, even the soil of which had been cursed because of the fall. He subjected himself to the suffering. He suggested, subjected himself, did he not, even to the evil. And so it was God invading that place where so many of us, corporately and individually, live life without him and have our own versions of rebellion against him. So he came and lived and walked perfectly. And he didn't participate in the fall. He was subject to the fall. He suffered because of the consequences of the fall. But he, unlike all the rest of us, did not participate. And the Bible says he's the only one who's ever lived perfectly without one single sin, without one single thought of rebellion against God and so he was in a position like no other being God who came to live in the flesh live perfectly and because of that he intervened on our behalf 
And so the answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people, is the incomplete question is, therefore what? And this was God's answer to the therefore what? And the answer was Jesus until Jesus. And he came and lived perfectly. Back to Isaiah again. Remember, Isaiah wrote this before Jesus ever came to the earth, inspired by God, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've heard that before. We've heard that so often. In fact, we may be so familiar. You know, one of my ag teachers in college said, familiarity breeds contempt. Oh, that we wouldn't become so familiar with this line that we're contemptuous and don't see it again. And don't feel it again. And don't recognize again. But fresh and new every single day. Really what Jesus went to in our behalf. And what he did. And so not only did he suffer the consequences of living in a fallen world. He took the weight of your and mine. Even in the future. The weight of our rebellion on himself. And he took all of that with him. We, use, we have a term for that don't we? It's called a ransom. You know someone is... Kidnapped happens today. Someone is kidnapped and the kidnapper calls, the, say, the parents or family members of the one who's been kidnapped. What do they do? They say, I'll make a deal with you. If you will send me money, we will let him go. And in the same way, God himself came in flesh and said, I will be the ransom. I will pay the ransom. And that's what we, he did. It's what we celebrate at Easter time, isn't it? And not only did he pay the ransom with his own life, but he then showed the power of God. Is God good and powerful? He sure is. So much, though, that he conquered that which is the enemy of all of us. He even conquered death. But even while Jesus walked on the earth, he started giving some hints to this. You remember the story about Lazarus, a very close friend of Jesus. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, all very close people to Jesus. And in fact... When word came to him that Lazarus had died, remember what Jesus did? He wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, two words. And so Jesus was touched, just like you and I, by the sting of death, even in people who are close to us. They had sent for Jesus before him while Lazarus was still sick. And as you read the story, Jesus delayed before he came. He didn't drop everything. Oh, he could have. But he was delayed, and, and to them he seemed to be dawdling. And why hasn't he intervened? And then when Jesus got there, remember what Martha said? Oh, if you had just gotten here earlier, you could have saved us from all of this. And remember what Jesus said? He's asleep. And then somebody said, oh, he's saying, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead. And Jesus corrected, he said, well, no, actually, no, he is dead. But it's not the end. It's not the end of it. You know how the story went. Jesus went in the room and spoke to Lazarus, took him by the hand, and rose him back to life. But you know what? Even with the intervention of Jesus then, giving us a clue about what's going to happen ultimately, we're going to get to that next. Lazarus still died. Or he would be alive. To, he'd be in the news today, wouldn't he? And so even after that kind of an event, Lazarus still died. He too is living in a world that's fallen and broken and suffering the consequence. He suffered the consequences of it too, ultimately. And you saw that, see, this wasn't, none of this took God by surprise. This was not like, oh no, that went bad. What are we going to be able to do now? Plan B, let's come up with one. What do you think, Jesus? What do you think we should do? No, this was the plan from the beginning. And this was one of the things that I thought of as I was preparing for this message this way, this week. Even evil is being used by God in the world today to show his greatness. Because you see, the reason that we know that story about Lazarus was because Jesus intervened. And so we know more about Jesus because of his death than if he had never even died. And on a grander scheme, scheme, we will even know more about the grace of God because of the rescue than if it had all gone as planned forever. And so even that God can use the tragedies that come because of our rebellion in order to give him glory, that is a part of the answer to why do bad things happen to good people? That even in the bad things, 
that he will be given the glory for it. Well, let's go ahead. Because of Jesus. So then, you know, uh, we're, we're not just, uh, you know, called upon to endure. Okay, I guess this is as good as it gets. Let's just hang in there, everybody. Let's, you know, stay connected with each other. But, you know, there's a real hope. And this is not just fairy tale stuff. This is real. You know, back there, the same Isaiah also saw how the whole thing is going to play out. And uh, we're, we're not just waiting for a resurrection that's, you know, individual. You know, all of creation is waiting for restoration. And it's called redemption. It will be redeemed, made valuable again, is what that word means. And so there will be redemption on a grand scale. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Well, Isaiah did. And this is what he wrote, what it's going to be like. And this is what we can anticipate. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. You know, those that were mortal enemies. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. What a great picture. Of redemption, right? The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together. You know what? It's all going to be made completely perfect again. Isaiah wasn't the only one that wrote about that. In fact, Paul also said, and he even mentioned some of the things that I'd, I'd already referred to. Let's see if I can find my notes. I've been far from them, haven't I? Yeah. Far from my notes, it's what I get. Uh, Paul said this, considering the time when all of this is redeemed again. He said this, I consider that our present sufferings, acknowledging that, are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And here's what he says about it. For the creation, all of creation... It's not just us, even the mountains and the stars and the sun and the moon. They're all waiting for redemption. Even creation waits in eager, but how does it wait? In eager expectation. Isn't that good? For the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to frustration. Acknowledging that. Paul's writing. But not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. You know, there is another sub topic and that is the role of the enemy and we know that that's certainly a part of it but if if we try to use that to blame instead of recognize our own fault then we've done ourselves great fault but we do we have an enemy but we participated and to see creation itself listen to the promise will be liberated from its bondage to decay to decay a good way of putting it bondage to decay Everything going away. Uh, entropy is the word that physics use for that. And brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so yes, there is a problem. Started out good. Then there was a fall. And we participate in the fall. But then Jesus intervened. And in the future, it's all going to be made right again. John said in Revelation, I told you we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation, the whole Bible. This is what John saw. Remember who John was. He was one of the twelve who went on the three-year camp out with Jesus. He's the only one of the twelve who wasn't martyred for his faith, except for the one, you know, that turned his back on Jesus. And he ended up, though, instead of being murdered for his faith, he was uh, exiled to an island, a des deserted island called Patmos. And it's from Patmos that John did his writing. We have the Gospel of John, and we have the book of Revelation. We have first, second, third John that he wrote from that island. And this is what he said in the last of the books that he wrote. He said, I have a vision. A new heaven and a new earth. When there will be, get this term, no more crying. No more pain. And the curse will be done away. Yeah. That's why we gather in this room every Sunday, isn't it? We're not oblivious to the consequences of the fall, our contribution to the fall. 
but we have a hope that nobody else can have. We can all access that hope because when Jesus begins to do that work in our lives, we begin to see up close and personal, don't we? The restoration, the redemption. And when we see him doing that in our lives, we go, wow, if he could do that in my life, then I can understand that he can do that in all of creation because I could be numbered among the most stubborn. And if he's doing that work in my life, I have great hope. Oh, he still has work to do. Certainly does. But I've already seen a lot of it he's doing. And I don't have any difficulty at all imagining a new heaven and a new earth where there would be no more crying and no more pain because he's already shown me. And in doing so, I see his glory even because of evil and suffering. Isn't that good? And you know what? When you and I have friends who are struggling with things, you know, my grandmother died or my ex-wife did this to me. You know what? We need to take them very seriously and recognize how legitimate those, con those concerns are. I mentioned C.S. Lewis at the beginning, did I not? Abandoned his childhood faith because his mother died when he was 10 years old. But later in life, due to his friend J.R.R. R. Tolkien, with whom he taught at Oxford, you know, Tolkien began to share his faith with Lewis. Lewis, an avowed atheist in a very, very cold and very dark environment of that university campus, Oxford. And over the years, God, uh, 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 Lewis began to see the truth of what Tolkien was saying. And so he embraced again, you know, the loving and the powerful God. He didn't marry until late in life. And uh, when he did marry, his wife's name was Joy. But four years later, guess what? She died of cancer. Like his mother had done when he was 10 years old. But because of what he had known of God by that time, you know what? He had, he had no need to abandon his faith. And so when we get to know the God who's doing a restorative work in our lives and those difficult things happen... We don't have to give up on him because he wasn't strong enough or wasn't nice enough to shield me from this pain or this suffering or this loss. He's right here with me in it. And because of him and the hope that he gives me, yeah, I'm still suffering losses, still contributing to the losses, but I can no longer blame on God my own rebellion and the consequences thereof. Good God. He's a good, good father. And uh, we have come together this morning and gone through this series of thought. And that's one of the great answers to one of the most difficult questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's why. And that's what we can do with it. Let's end by praying. And this morning, if you have one of those bad, bad things going on in your life, you know, I so often fail to mention the blue cards that, are, uh, that we use to register our guests. We ask for you to let us know who you are. They also have a place on the back of them for you to provide a prayer request. And I know that sometimes things hurt so badly that you can't even talk about them. We invite you to do so. If you would like to pray with me or someone else in our church, we end giving you an opportunity, an invitation to do that every Sunday. But if there's something that's so private, something that hurts so badly that you can only write it out, do so. And in the foyer, we have, there's an oak box out there. It has a slit in the top of it. You can put that card there. You can do it anonymously. Or you can put your name and phone number on it, and I'd be glad to call you about that. But if you would just like to share that and be, make sure that somebody else is praying for you, that's a way you can do it, okay? And let's pray together now. All right, let's do it. Lord, thank you. You are a good, good God. You made a wonderful creation. Shows us your glory every single day. But we, with all the rest of creation, wait in great expectation of the time that you will make it all good again. And we thank you that you've already begun that work in us and that you've given us the company of folks like these in this room that we wait in great expectation for the time that you will make it all good again. In the meanwhile, keep giving us hope. And it's you that we trust in Jesus' name. Amen.